the first two chapters, we looked at Jesus, this revelation of him as life and light. And we saw his glory. We beheld him as the son of God. There have been so many titles, names given to him. One thing that I, I would like as a teacher to help you with. We cannot isolate Jesus Christ, our God, to one nature, our character. God is equally light, truth, and life. He is equally holy, glorious, as He is loving. Every facet, and this is complex because so many of us get a, a misconception about God. God is love, and that's the way that we see God. Or we see God as holy and distant and untouchable. And that's the only perspective that some people have of God. Some people only see God as harsh, cruel, distant. I, I, as I was looking at that, as John began revealing Jesus Christ, he said, we beheld his glory. Now, let's read from John 1 and verse 14. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. We beheld His glory, but He is full of grace and truth. After Jesus' first miracle that we looked at a, a couple of weeks ago, when He turned water into wine, John again spoke of his glory in relationship to the miracle. John 2 and 11. This beginning of signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee. Now I, I want to point out this word signs. Signs sometimes has a, a different connotation to some people. But his signs or his miracles were both signs. The miracle of turning water into wine was a sign to them. It wasn't just for their convenience for a wedding feast. It was a sign of who Jesus was. The begin this beginning of signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. In the past, in the Old Testament, and even up until Jesus' time, and in, in a lot of ways, even today, the glory of God has been intolerable. You, you, if you're not right with God, if your spirit is not right with God, not in, and you come into the presence of His glory, such a conviction and a sense of I do not belong here hits us. Because God is a glorious and a holy God. But now in Jesus Christ, the glory of God reveals God's salvation. God has a plan to bring men, you and me, believers, into a fellowship with Him. The signs that Jesus did in the New Testament, and I would also say the things that He's still doing today, were not only filled with glory, they were full of grace and truth. And, and this is what happens today. And really, this is why signs, wonders, and miracles take place is to reveal the truth and the grace of God. Every one of them do that. His signs, Jesus' signs when he was here among us, uh, drew people to Jesus Christ. And when they came to him, they found this gospel, this gospel message of grace and truth and acceptance and salvation and forgiveness and healing and deliverance. In our text, there is a Pharisee named Nicodemus who came to Jesus 
as a result of the signs that were done. Have you ever, have any of you ever been in miracle crusades? Do you know what I'm talking about? Uh, years and years ago, old Roberts used to have miracle crusades and there would be big tents. A.A. Allen, many others have had miracle crusades. Uh, some of them drew thousands upon thousands of people. One of the things that should happen any time a miracle takes place is people should be drawn to the Lord. It is a sign for that reason. In John chapter 3, let's read about Nicodemus. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God. For no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Nicodemus was a ruler of the Jews. Now what does that mean? He was a senator or a member of the Sanhedrin, the ruling body of the Jews. You and I don't understand this because we do not live in a church state. In that economy, in that uh, life, the, the Sanhedrin not only was over the church, they were also over your community life. If you, if you did something against the Sanhedrin and, and were excommunicated from the church, you might as well sell your business because nobody would do business with you. It, it, it was that kind of environment. Nicodemus was a Pharisee, and that is one of the strictest sects, S-E-C-T-S, of the, of the Jews. They followed the traditions, and uh, I don't know if you know about the Jewish traditions of these sects, but they, they have hundreds and thousands of traditions that are extra biblical things that they felt was very pertinent to life. And they, what they did is they took the law and they said, well, the law says you shall not work on the Sabbath. So what, what constitutes work? So they, they devised all of these traditions about around a law to determine what work is. Now, work has changed quite a bit. Some of us work at a computer all day. And others look at us and say, when are you going to get up and work? <laughs> you know, there's different kinds of work. Uh, in their mind, work was more a physical thing. Jesus asked, are you a master in Israel? The word master means a leading official or teacher. Now, there, there's some hidden message here that you need to know. What, what Jesus is asking and implying is not just that he was a ruler, but that he was also a teacher, someone who had studied the law, someone who knew the traditions, someone who had this, this reputation that he knew God. That's what Jesus is saying. He would have been an expert in the law. He held this official uh, position or a highest rank, a capacity. He was authorized. He was accepted by the public and by the Sanhedrin. The scripture says here, Nicodemus came to Jesus by night. Now there's an implication that this was a clandestine meeting or a private meeting. Maybe he feared what others were thinking. But as I follow the text, it appears more to me that Nicodemus was coming to Jesus at a convenient time, a convenience for him. Uh, because in the text, Nicodemus says, we know. Well, he's implying that others have been talking about Jesus Christ with him. We know that you are a teacher come from God. So he's looking at, at Jesus Christ and the community has been talking. 
It's my feeling that Nicodemus probably would not have made this meeting if it would not have been that we have been talking. Now take a look at Nicodemus' journey and listen to his words. In, in verse 2, he says, Rabbi, we know you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. We know, we know. Uh, for no one can perform miraculous signs that you are doing if God is not with him. Jesus had been the point of conversation. In fact, this is, again, remember, this is the introduction of Jesus into the community. Uh, what he did when he cleansed the temple. Uh, at the conclusion of that story, Jesus also did many other things, many other miraculous signs in chapter 2 and verse 23 that caused people to believe in his name. So as Jesus was doing these signs, everybody started talking. Now, the reason that they are talking is they have been looking for the Messiah to come. You know, when you're anticipating someone to come who is going to deliver your nation, who is going to supply the answers for everyone, you begin expecting who is the Messiah. I do believe, according to what the scripture tells us, that in the fullness of time, God sent his son. Everybody knew this was his time. It's like we're living right now. In the day of the second coming of the Lord, the signs are all around us that Jesus is coming again. And it should not catch any one of us off guard to one day wake up and the rapture of the church take place and we're in heaven. What a day that will be. So, Nicodemus says, we've all been talking about these signs and we, are con we have concluded that you are probably the Messiah. And so he, he's, he's there really, I think, as an embassy or an ambassador for, for the group to find out, are you the Messiah? So he's, he's prodding Jesus. So after Jesus cleansed the temple, and many believed that, that he was because of the things that he had done, everyone began to pay more attention to Jesus' words, to his actions, and they're all on edge with this expectation that the Messiah has come. Nicodemus was compelled to find this one thing out from Jesus Christ, he, he says, we've been examining what you have done. I think it would be noteworthy, and I'm not going to go back and do a review, but just a quick uh, statement. He turned water into wine. It had to get out. He cleansed the temple. He did other miraculous signs. Uh, the witness of what happened with John the Baptist when the Holy Spirit descended in the form of a dove. These people were not living in a bubble separated from everything. In fact, it is my contention that as soon as these things started happening, it started spreading through the community. Look, the Messiah has come. So Nicodemus says, are you the Messiah of God? Jesus recognized something about Nicodemus that... Uh, his pious position hid from a lot of people. See, God sees past our exterior, our facade. We can put on all of these airs of being somewhat important and being someone, but He sees what's really going on in the heart. 
And so instead of talking to him about the theology and the hour and whether he is the Messiah, Jesus bypassed, it seems he totally bypassed Nicodemus' question about are you the Messiah of God? And he gets down to what is really going on in Nicodemus' life. I think that it's important for every one of us to know that when we come to God ourselves, even today, he does not really want to play games with us about where we are and who we are. He wants to get down to the nitty gritty of our lives and what's really going on in our heart. According to Jesus, these signs and miracles were, were really not important. Nicodemus needed to be changed. I think that it's noteworthy that every time that you, you notice this in the scripture, every time that Jesus is ministering to any individual, it seems everything else that is so important to everybody else is bypassed and he's focused in on that individual. You remember the woman at the well. You remember Nicodemus. Over and over, Jesus does it. He goes out, his, out of his way to meet the Gadarean demoniac. This is the way that Jesus is. John 3.3 3. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. This is new language that Nicodemus has not heard. It's radical. Verse 7 says, Jesus is still speaking. He says, do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. Just, this is not a theological new concept, but, although the words are new. Theologically, this has been produced, this thought has been produced with the, the prophets way back in the Old Testament. Let me show you in Jeremiah chapter 24 and verse 7. God was speaking to them and says, Then I will give them a, a heart to know me, that I am the Lord, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God, and they shall return to me with their whole heart. See, it doesn't say anything about born again. It's just he'll give them a new heart. Ezekiel 11, in verse 19, God says, Then I will give them one heart, and I will put a new spirit within them and take the stony heart out of their flesh and give them a heart of flesh that they may walk in my statutes and keep my judgments and do them and they shall be my people and I will be their God. Again to Ezekiel, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you and I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will keep my judgments and do them. What God is talking about through the prophets is really this same born again experience that Jesus is talking about. God is going to come and he's going to get, make what has been hardened and stony new. Hallelujah. And when he does, he will cause them to walk right, talk right, and live right. Hallelujah. John 3.3. 3. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Born again can have three different meanings. First, it can mean born from the beginning or completely and fully uh, a new start. So a person has a new start in life. Uh, it's a new beginning. They're born again. Second, it can mean to do a thing a second time, a repeated act, or to start all over again. I've done that myself. I've uh, started a painting and uh, messed it up and just uh, got the scraper and scraped all of the paint off and started over. It's a new beginning. Same canvas, a new beginning. Third, it can mean to be born from above, from heaven or from God. This is the point to be born again. We must be born completely and fully with a complete and full change. Here, here it is really in our life. 
When you are born again of God, it's not, it's not a, well, I, I'm changing this one thing of my life. No, it's, it's a radical change. It's a new, it's a new life. We are born all over again in, in the sense of, of a second time. Uh, we must be born from above, from God. I think all of these really give us a definition that helps us understand what it is to be born again. We must have a radical change that takes care of the old and starts everything new. One must be born again. But Jesus says this, and I think this is very critical. And look, look at this with me. If he's not born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. What does that mean? He must be born again or he will never see. In verse number 5 it says he, he will never enter the kingdom of God. That is talking about heaven. That is talking about our ultimate relationship with God for eternity. If anyone wants to enter into the joys that God has prepared for us in heaven, you must be born again. Verse 7 says, do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. Jesus is proposing what appears uh, to be impossible, but it's not impossible with God. He's revealing God's plan of salvation and an entrance into his kingdom and to everlasting life. This new birth, first of all, is a spiritual birth. Verse number four, Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? You can tell how carnal he is. He's looking at this only as, an, as a human being. Verse 5, Jesus answered, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Verse 7, Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from. And where it goes, so is everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus was puzzled by this concept. He didn't understand born again. He, he asked a question. Is it possible for a man to enter a second time into his mother's womb? That's not what Jesus is saying. He's talking about a spiritual birth. And Jesus gave him a five-fold answer. Follow these. I have a short uh, of these on the screen. Your notes haven't expanded. Jesus gave the source of the new birth. Unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. The term born of water suggests varied ideas. Let me expand on those. The Hebrews considered natural birth being born of water. When a woman's water broke, the baby was born. Some think it was the water of the Word. Others suggest that it refers to water baptism as a requirement for salvation. But the Bible does not support that you have to be baptized in water in order to be saved. Water baptism is a sign that we have been saved. It is done in, in obedience. It's a, a, a step of obedience to the faith that we already have. Water baptism can also refer to the Holy Spirit. Jesus' words, born of water and of the Spirit, are a clear expression of uh, spiritual purification by the Holy Spirit. Isaiah and Ezekiel referred to water, wind, and spirit when they were speaking of the Holy Spirit. These are emblems are signs of the Holy Spirit. I don't know personally I think that this born of water and the Spirit that water really in my opinion really refers to number five. It's a function of the Holy Spirit. But I can also see 
that we have to be born physically before we can be born again. You cannot be saved unless you are a human being that's living. But once you have your existence, anyone can come to God and be saved. <clears throat> Rebirth is a prerequisite for seeing the kingdom of God. John 3, 3 says, Without being born again, a man cannot see or enter the kingdom of God. Number three, new birth is a spiritual, is spiritual in nature. It's not a physical birth. It is, it is a spiritual birth. It is not a material birth. It is a spiritual thing that happens on the inside. The flesh can never enter into the spiritual world. It is something that happens on the inside of us, but when it happens on the inside of us, it's amazing to me how the transformation on the inside affects our life on the outside. You cannot remain the same once you have been born again. Jesus emphasized the necessity of the new birth. Verse 7 said, Do not marvel that I said to you, you must... You must be born again. If you want to go to heaven, you must be born again. If you want to have relationships with God, you must be born again. If you want to be a child of God, you must be born again. Being a ruler of the Jews did not exempt Nicodemus from this necessity that he needed to be born again. Now this must have been something that was hard for Nicodemus to receive because being a Pharisee and also being part of the Sanhedrin and being a ruler or a master of them, he probably felt pretty highly of himself. And it would have been demeaning to say you do not escape this necessity. Everyone must be born again. And number five, the Spirit of God works just like the wind. Now this week, we saw the wind work. <laughs> I may not know how it works, exactly where it came from or where it's going, but I can sense the power of the wind. I can see the effects of it. The Spirit of God works in a sovereign manner. I've said this many times, and let me reiterate it just a moment. When the Spirit of God is moving, we need to move with Him. You cannot make, coerce, force the Spirit of God to do anything. He moves sovereignly as He will. But if the Spirit of God starts drawing someone, pay, pay attention to this. If you're trying to win someone to the Lord, when their heart starts becoming tender, you can sense it. It's evidenced by the tears. It's evidenced by an uneasiness. There, there's this feeling immediately of panic that arises in them because they're losing control the Spirit of God is moving in. When you sense that, that's the time to move with the Spirit of God. It's very critical because the effects of salvation are brought about by the working of the Holy Spirit. John 1 and verse 12. But as many as received Him, to them He gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in His name, who are born not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. Nicodemus answered and said to, the, to him, How can these things be? In other words, his heart was touched by what Jesus was saying, but he didn't understand. He wanted to know how this could be. Nicodemus, this master in Israel, I, I, I've noticed this throughout my life. There are a lot of people who have become biblical scholars over the text, but they do not know God. 
So I was studying in theology. It's amazing to me. So many books on theology are almost agnostic and atheistic. They don't recognize the true power and the glory of God and the working of the Holy Spirit. There is something about the, the realities that are different than, than just the knowledge. The knowledge of God is wonderful, but the experience of His power is better. Amen. When you come to know Him in His power and in His glory, it's better than all of the knowledge. Knowledge will help us, but knowledge is not an end in itself. Titus 3 and verse 5. Titus says, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy, He saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Spirit. Nicodemus was a man who was accustomed to doing everything by the law and tradition. And now Jesus is saying, in reality, it your works of righteousness are not going to, to suffice in this. You, you, need, you need the work of the Spirit. At this point, Jesus started talking about things that only God knows. I want you to notice Jesus' use of the plural pronouns. Jesus answered and said to him, Are you the teacher of Israel and do you not know these things? Most assuredly, I say to you, we speak what we know and we testify what we have seen and you do not receive our testimony. It's like Jesus is talking for him and someone else. He's talking for Jesus, the Son of God, God the Father, and God the Holy Spirit. Jesus is speaking realities. And as we progress in our studies, we're going to see this over and over. Jesus said, the words that I speak, they are not my words. They are the words of the Father. What I'm speaking are words and deeds that are inspired by the Holy Spirit. Jesus is speaking to him and he says, we speak and we know and we testify what we have seen. In other words, Jesus is setting himself apart from the religious aristocracy and the pride of those who have mastered Israel. And he's saying, we, we have a witness that is higher than your witness. And Nicodemus, who was a scholar and master, didn't even know how to be saved. John 3 and verse 12. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? Stop a minute. Jesus just said, I'm talking about things that I have seen and witnessed. And now he says, I'm talking to you about things that you don't even understand. It's impossible for flesh and blood to comprehend the spirit. He said, if I've told you earthly things and you don't believe, things that relate to the things that's happening here on earth and you don't believe, what if I started exposing to you heavenly things? He says, no one has ascended to heaven, but he who came down from heaven, that is the Son of Man who is in heaven. Jesus is saying, the earthly things are here. I'm talking to you about things that God is about to do in your life and in the life of anyone who believes. But then he says, I, I know heavenly things and I can talk to you about things that are beyond your comprehension. Jesus knows things that Nicodemus cannot know. 1 Corinthians 2 and 12 says, The natural man cannot know the things of the Spirit of God, for they are spiritually deserved. Verse 16 of Romans 8. The Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. How can we know the things of God? How can we know 
deeper truths. How can we know heavenly things? The Spirit bears witness. 1 John 4 and 13. By this we know that we abide in Him and He in us because He has given us His Spirit. Jesus is ready to reveal wonderful mysteries of the kingdom of God and Nicodemus is struggling to understand even the basics. Jesus said, you do not receive our witness and you do not believe. There's the problem, isn't it? Unbelief hinders our progress into the things of God. And here's the, pro here's the reason. The human nature, flesh and blood, cannot receive the things of the Spirit because they are revealed or born witness to us by the Spirit of God. So Jesus began talking about heavenly things. Verse 13. He says, No one has ascended to heaven but he who came down from heaven, that is the Son of Man who is in heaven. Jesus said he came down from heaven. He was saying no one is able to ascend to heaven. But Jesus said, I have come down. What Jesus is saying, no one in the flesh can penetrate the spiritual world. But because what is born of the earth is earthly, something has to happen. But Jesus is saying, I'm different than anyone that you have ever known. That's really what he's saying. He's giving the answer that he had that Nicodemus has asked. He's, he's telling him, I am the Messiah. I am the one who's come down from God. Jesus was saying, I am timeless. I am, I am limitless. I am the Son of God which was in heaven. Hallelujah. But he doesn't say which was in. He says which is in heaven. What does this mean? It means that Jesus did not deny or walk away from his eternal being when he was born of a virgin. He is still the Son of God. He is still the eternal Son of God. Then Jesus taught how to receive this new birth. First, the Son of Man must be lifted up. John 3 and verse 14. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. In Numbers chapter 21, verse 4 through 9, if you don't know this story, turn and read, to, read about it later. The children of Israel had rebelled against God. God had been supplying water and manna and taking care of them, protecting them in their wilderness wanderings. He'd been a shield, a protection to, for them on every side. And the people started complaining. They started saying, we're so sick and tired of, of this manna. What is it anyway? And they were complaining about God's provision. None of them had been sick. None of them had been suffering. But they were complaining about what God had given them. And so God said, I've had enough of it. And so God sent vipers or snakes that started biting the people. And every one of them that were bitten broke out in sores all over. And many, of, many hundreds and thousands of them died. And in the process, God told Moses to make a bronze serpent and to raise it up on a pole. And he said, anyone who looks upon the serpent will live. And Jesus says, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up. What does he mean? The serpent was hanging on a pole symbolized Satan's defeat. Jesus being lifted up on a cross testifies of the defeat of the power of sin. Hallelujah. The plague of sin that is in our life. If he is lifted up, he will draw them into him. The lifting up of Christ has a fourfold meaning. It represents the cross. If he is lifted up on the cross. Secondly, it is... It, 
talks about the resurrection. If Jesus is lifted up out of the grave and out of death, he will draw men to him. And then third, if he's lifted up in the ascension and exaltation to the right hand of the Father, he will draw men to him. And then fourth, it loosely means in our worship, if we lift up Jesus Christ, he will draw men to him. I find every one of these is applicable and true. I do believe that the last one is not as much involved in this verse, but I have seen it many times. When people start worshiping and exalting the Lord, people come to Jesus Christ. Amen. John 12 and verse 31. Salvation only comes by looking at the Son, looking upon the Son of Man. John 12, 31. Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. And if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. 1 Peter 2 and 24. Who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness. By his stripes you are healed. The second act is man's belief in Jesus Christ. Jesus points this out so clearly. It's verses that most people, even those that are not Christians, know these two verses. Whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting or eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting or eternal life. John, pardon me, Isaiah 53 and verse 5. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. And by his stripes we are healed. If we want eternal life, we must believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sin. It's critical for every one of us. If we're new to serving God, this is a critical message. If we've been serving God all of our lives, this is a very critical message. The only way, the only way to eternal life and to heaven is through being born again. Born again by the Spirit. Born again as a result of the work that Jesus has done.